Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Marketing Kind Exchange. Uh, and today we're going to be asking, are women the answer to climate change? And to help us explore that thought, uh, we have um, Dr. Anne Kopf with us. Uh, my name is Caroline Taylor. I'm a founding member of Marketing Kind and was previously the Chief Marketing Officer for IBM's Global Business. Uh, and I'm really delighted to be your host for this exchange. Um, as we've got a number of guests with us this evening who aren't members of Marketing Kind yet, I thought maybe I should just give you a brief introduction as to who Marketing Kind is. Well, we're a community of business leaders, of marketers and change makers, and we come together to make marketing mean more. Uh, as a community, we support each other in becoming more conscious leaders. We use our expertise to support good causes, and we, we seek to understand and influence the systems that we're part of. Um, our exchange gatherings explore the bigger narratives that we live and work by and, and how we can change these narratives for the better, which really comes to life in this evening's theme. As I said, today we're asking, are women the answer to climate change? Now, that may be a contentious question for some of you, but we are going to explore how inequality and failure of gender inclusion is hampering our ability to address the climate crisis. And the inspiration for this exchange is, is Anne Kopp's recent book, How Women Can Save the Planet. Now, if you're not familiar with Anne's work, um, and I hope she'll allow me this, <laughs> let me quote from the closing paragraph of her most recent book, because I think this sets us up so very well. She says, we need a coalition of hopers, enablers and imaginers of climate champions matching the ferocity of those indigenous climate warriors in the Amazon and the Chirado. Visiting hours for despair will be strictly limited. Here, all are welcome, whatever their gender, sexual identity and preference, abilities or disability, age or social class, and however they've been racialized. A glittering social diversity to equal the Earth's biodiversity, a dance of human ingenuity, a hubbub of hope, and a synchrony of voices united to create a healthy planet one that is gender equal, racially equal, and climate just. It is time. Now, I think that is a perfect starting point for our discussion, but perhaps I should give you a slightly more formal introduction to Anne. Um, she's Professor of Life Writing and Culture at London Metropolitan University, a writer, sociologist, and award-winning journalist. She teaches on the Creative, Digital, and Professional Writing MA, and is one of the organizers of the University's Center for Life Writing and Oral History. Her books include Doctoring the Media, The Reporting of Health and Medicine, The Human Voice, The Story of a Remarkable Talent, and How to Age. She co-edited A Time to Speak Out, Independent Jewish Voices on Israel, Zionism, and Jewish Identity. Anne, wow. <laughs> Welcome to this uh, Marketing Kind Exchange. And thank, thank you for giving us your time and expertise. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, a, an interesting new environment for me to discuss these issues in, so I'm really looking forward to it. Fantastic. Well, look, I'm going to kick us off. Um, I think just up front, I'd love to explore with you a little. What inspired you to, to dive into this issue of gender and equality and those aspects of climate change? Um, two things, really. One was that I was... Um, looking at and thinking about uh, the city and particularly gender in the city that a publisher was interested in me exploring that and I kept thinking oh it's all been said before and and then I it kept returning to the climate crisis for me and when I started to look into it I discovered that there was a wealth of research going back at least 15 years about the links between gender inequality and the climate crisis and um, the gendered causes and impact of the climate crisis that I knew nothing about. And I got really interested and excited by that research. And I thought, how come there's all this research, but it isn't part of the national and international conversation? That was one thing. Another thing is that um, my younger daughter, uh, began to get extremely anxious about the climate crisis. And we, we sort of reversed positions because I am not known for my optimism. You know, if a, if a catastrophic thought can occur, it will fly into my mind. Um, whereas um, my younger daughter, Lola, is a most effervescent, vital young woman. Um, 
But on this, we seem to have changed position. She was uh, really very gloomy and pessimistic. And I found myself in a rather more optimistic position. So in a way, I mean, the book is addressed at my two daughters. Uh, this was in part an attempt to um, get Lola to be less pessimistic and to show her that there are causes for optimism, but not in a kind of Pollyanna-ish way, not, uh, you know, all be well, and, uh, but really we can tackle this providing we look at these other aspects as well. I think, yeah, I mean, it's I, I, honestly, I, uh, until um, Anna and Paul highlighted your book to me and I started reading it, I, I, you know, shame on me. I've been thinking about and involved in stuff around sustainability and the environment for a long, long time. And I genuinely hadn't, hadn't thought about it through this lens. It's such a, it's such a powerful lens to, to look at it through. Um, so I love that you, you know, you started, you, you, it wasn't what you started, but it's what you discovered when you, you do it really hard. Um, so if I think about that, is it, is it, is it equally important as we think about climate change and, and climate change prevention or slow down uh, decarbonisation or more kind of mitigation or is it is it massively important to both or does you know, one of them uh, come up more strongly than the other do you think? I, I think really we have to do deal with both of them you know we have to do what we can to arrest the decline. I went to um, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2013, I went to a boot camp for journalists on, on climate change, which was extremely interesting. And one of the um, expert um, uh, people who gave talks there, lectures there, was someone saying, um, just imagine a very, and this, this is an analogy used quite often, imagine a very full bath and it's almost at the top and the tap is running. So obviously what you need to do is to really turn down the tap until it's a trickle. But obviously, you know, it's going to overflow. So you need to put down things. I mean, I'm, I'm chuckling to myself. You need to put down things on the floor to protect it. Because my husband just phoned me and said, oh, we had an explosion of water today at home. And he spent the day mopping up. But anyway, you need to... Um, so you need to um, use mitigation as well. I mean, the problem is that, that it, it's often framed as how do we develop resilience? And I think resilience is can be, not invariably, but can be quite a dangerous concept because it, it, it's quite a fatalistic one. And um, we really, can't all be resilient in the same way. You know, we're, we're starting, and, and this is why we have to really start from, I mean, people, people are very resistant to this subject. I've had people say to me, look, we're facing catastrophe. There's no time for special pleading. There's no time for sectarian interests, you know, feminism and all the rest of it. We'll deal with that later. That is not the case. We are dealing with huge structural inequalities. Uh, and the most significant one is between the global north and the global south. But the equally significant ones are around social class. They're around ethnicity and how people are racialized. They're around gender, sexual identity and preference, disability. All these things intersectionally play into the extent to which we are able to resist the effects of the climate crisis and the extent to which we have far fewer resources to deal with it. So really, what I'm saying is, and this is not a, an easy message to give out, because one wants to give very bright, positive, uplifting messages. And my book is positive. It's far more positive. I found myself being far more uplifted and positive than I thought possible. And you've quoted the last section, which I've completely forgotten about. <laughs> um, but we have to start with a real uh, acknowledgement of global inequality and how that has created the current situation and how we can only change things by tackling that. And that 
wonderful saying of the American writer Audre Lorde that I quote in the book, which is, the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. We can't use the same things that got us into this situation to get us out of it. So that tells us we have to really look in very different places to stop this, or else, you know, the bath is really going to overflow in a way that um, the most vulnerable won't survive. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very, I was very uh, taken and very captured by this issue that um, far too often the the impacts of climate change, as as are already being felt around the world, are they are hitting those least able to deal with them. They're hitting the impoverished. They're hitting uh, minorities. You know, um, they're hitting and those who've done least to cause them. <laughs> indeed, that's, indeed, that's what's so unfair. Um, that you know, these are not caused by the people who are being impacted. And of course, what's happened in the last few years is that uh, in the global north, we've started to feel the impact much more. So you've had floods in Germany, for example, you've had the wildfires in California and bushfires in Australia. Mm -hmm. And you have Greta Thunberg, who's done some excellent consciousness raising. But when she says, our house is on fire, people in the global south, particularly poor women of color, mm -hmm. say, our house has been on fire for a very long time. You just haven't noticed or cared because it didn't affect you. And I mean, you've mm. got a place like Bangladesh where the annual flooding, I mean, you know, you often find a million people are displaced. You know, we have it the head of the, you know, headlines of the news if, you know, a hundred people in Germany or in Somerset are affected. We really have to widen our focus and look globally. And the problem is that when, I, I mean, and I totally get this because this was my position for a long time too. When we do that, it can feel so overwhelming and so hopeless that one can feel, look, it's going to, it's all going to go pear-shaped anyway. You know, why not do anything? I mean, I've got a friend who was the first person, well, one of the two people who first made me think about climate climate change and the environment. One was actually in my 20s in my first job, a very long time ago, but another was about 20 years ago. And he is so pessimistic. And he says, well, we're all screwed and we've got to tell everyone. And I said, why do we have to tell everyone if we're all screwed? Because people will just feel hopeless. I don't feel we're all screwed. And I think there are so many solutions, both globally, nationally, um, locally and hyper-locally that can, can do things, that we can all work at these different levels. Um, and we cannot afford that kind of pessimism. We really can't, because we are going to be held accountable for future generations, either in our own family. And I really hate the idea that it's only parents who invested in this because it's such a calumny against people who don't have children to suggest that they don't care about the future. Um, I mean, you could say they're actually less selfish in that they are not producing, particularly in the global north, they're not producing children who are consuming so much. Um, but we have an obligation for future generations, all of us to get involved. And we don't have to do enormous things, but we have to do something. We all, all have to do something. Do you know, Anne, one of the things that really strikes me is, um, so climate change uh, and uh, climate change has the potential to really shine a light for the those of us who are privileged to live in the global north on, on the real impact of inequality. Not that people are stupid, not that they don't understand poverty or, 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 or the impact of being impoverished, um, or, of hunger, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I just wonder is, <laughs> If um, if getting a focus on 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 the on the people who are really being impacted by it right now have been for a long time, uh, getting a focus on them might just switch on a few more people into the fact because it's a it's a really interesting duality, isn't it? That we have to do something about climate change. We can't just keep wittering on about it and not actually taking action. But we also have to fix uh, the complete lack of social justice. 
um you know absolutely absolutely they totally go together like at the moment i mean think about how was it about six weeks ago we had the headlines about pakistan pakistan has disappeared from the headlines now now there are over six hundred and seventy-five thousand pregnant women in pakistan who are in flooded areas because a third of the country was was underwater who do not have access to a midwife now if you're a wealthy person, woman in the global north, yeah, you have your, um, you know, your regular checkups and they can pick up certain things. But really, um, if you have a good diet and you can afford enough to eat, you know, and all the rest of it, you, you in a sense don't need those. If you are living in an impoverished country, you really do need access to medical help, particularly, you know, if you are pregnant. And those women are there I mean, can you imagine, I mean, anyone who's had a baby, you know, particularly if you're your first child, it's it's terrifying to leap into the unknown. And you are, um, you are, um, sorry, I'm getting someone coming in with issues. Um, you are um, having uh, no access to care um, at all. Um, and, you know, then you might think, well, look, what can I do about this? I am in the global north. I don't have, you know, okay, I can give some money to charity. But actually, what we can do is put our voices to a really loud campaign for climate reparations. So this idea of climate justice, and part of that is the gender justice um, thing. So that was a slogan coined in Bali, I think in 2004, no, no um, climate justice without gender justice. These women and, you know, the Pakistani uh, and um, Antonio Guterres of uh, 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 the UN says, um, this is climate carnage. So we have an obligation. Now, we know that countries in the global north are not paying um, even what they've said they would give to countries in the global south, let alone reparations. And we owe them. And if this is going to impact all of us, because those of us who are comfortably off, um, you know, and I include myself in that, you know, who have a high standard of living, our, what we can do in our lives is going to have to really significantly change. But that will change in the knowledge that we are creating a more equitable um, and stable future because inequality creates instability, whether within countries or globally. And so if we put our, if we become part of this clamor for, um, for climate justice and climate reparations, it will become irresistible. And there are all kinds of ways we can do that, campaigns we can join. So I think the idea that we can't do anything, we are utterly without agency, is one danger. The other danger is the overstating what we can do as individuals. And I mean, I really, I got slightly pushed into calling my book what, How Women Can Save the Planet, because, you know, um, <laughs> someone said to me the subtitle should be, but we shouldn't have to, at least not on our own. And, you know, the idea of women as climate savior is just as damaging as the idea of women as you know permanent victims. I mean, we cannot do that. And and you know, I did one event, Caroline, where someone came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I almost didn't come because I thought this was going to be all about recycle, recycle, recycle. And she said, and I already do that, and I'm fed up with being kind of blamed for things. And I call it in my book, blame the dame. You know, there's this idea that. You know, women, is, women are shoppers in chief. Um, there's one Australian climate blogger who says, oh, I've totally cut my carbon footprint by doing X, Y, and Z, and women can do that. And, you know, the idea that we can buy our way to a sustainable planet. No, we can't. We can't because we cannot continue to consume at the level that we do. And I absolutely include myself in that. You know, I moved earlier this year. And boy, have I been consuming for England. And I am just completely, I mean, okay, I've got solar panels now. I've just bought an electric car, but still, you know, we cannot live in the same way that we are. And the very idea of the carbon footprint, I mean, 
this was something, you know, this is where you calculate what your carbon emissions are. Now, first of all, if you live in the global north, there's a limit below which you cannot fall by any individual action because, you know, it's not about individual emissions. And that whole idea of the carbon footprint was dreamed up in 2004 by o the um, advertising agency Og Ogilvy Mather um, on behalf of BP, British Petroleum, as a, as a quite frankly, as a distraction against, um, a, a, away from the fact that the fossil fuel companies are the ones who are extracting the fossil fuels in the, in the first place. I mean, you can bang on as much as you want about changing your consumption, but I can only consume what people produce. And so while I absolutely think there's a role for individual action, we cannot put it all on individuals. We've got to look at collective action. So you can see I'm talking about change on so many different levels. And this is what's good about it because it isn't just one level and we can all make an intervention in many different ways. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I mean, absolutely. And I think that's important that, that's really important that we, we A, get our heads around the fact that it isn't just, it is what we do, but it's what the organizations we're part of do and what the organizations we uh, buy into, whether it's investing or buying from or whatever, um, and make our, um, make our, views felt nice and loudly um so, and i think you know clearly that's that's really important um one of the things i i was fascinated by and i think is super important um in your book is just there's a there's a tension perhaps and i think you slightly touched on it there. there's a tension um between um people like yourself and many of us on on this this uh, exchange right now who are really passionate about this and and are very committed to finding ways forward and uh, that will will benefit but we are the privileged ones who live in the global north etc cetera, etc cetera, as, as you've just described um and then there are the people in and from those the places where the where the impact is really really felt very hard um and i'm very conscious in so many aspects of uh international development shall we say that this whole sort of white savior complex is a real <laughs> issue. And, 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 and yet there are people who are from the global north who are having really positive impact, um, but I'm not sure we hear the voices enough of those from the communities, from those, you know, from those indigenous communities very often. Um, so, do you, I mean, you, you, there's some fascinating stuff in, in your book around this. Talk to us a little bit about finding that balance because both voices are important, but, but one is much Absolutely. louder than the other. Absolutely. We do need both voices because, you know, as I say, you know, you look at Greta Thunberg and um, the, uh, you know, what she's managed, the discussions, the conversations she's managed to start um, that are uh, amazing in, in many respects. On the other hand, as I point out in my book, you know, the idea that this um, youth climate strike came out of nowhere is absolutely misleading. A lot of things were happening around the world that just didn't get attention. And even in the global north, you know, in the US, you had Jamie Margolin founding um, Zero uh, uh, Hour. You had the Sunshine Movement. These were started by young women of color, one of them queer. They had never got, the, they haven't sought the individual attention. I'm not saying that Thunberg did. On the contrary, she's tried to share the limelight. Mm. Um, then there was that infamous, notorious um, example where Vanessa Makate, um, the Ugandan activist, was with her. Um, I don't know if it was at a COP event. And she was, cut, you know, a woman of colour, young woman of colour, very articulate, spoke at the last COP, was cut out of the photograph. So the privileging of young, white, sort of photogenic, media-friendly voices, you know, um, Thunberg was portrayed as a kind of, you know, quirky, eccentric character because of her autism, her single-mindedness. You know, she looks so young and sort of rather cute with the yellow... Um, uh, uh, Macintosh, um, all of that fits in easily to a narrative. It's much more challenging. And for, for those of you who are here, I know this is your job um, in a way as, uh, as marketers to find, find ways of telling these stories. 
Um, and um, there are ways because, I mean, some of the stories um, uh, of indigenous women that I tell in the book, I mean, I have to, to fess up here that this younger daughter I mentioned works for Survival International. Um, the uh, charity that promotes and defends the rights of indigenous people around the world. And she's educated me a lot about this. And there are some amazing stories there of, I mean, I only barely, I touch on them in the book of women, you know, incredibly courageous women going out in the Amazon and um, uh, sabotaging uh, illegal mining, you know, great danger to themselves. I mean, great tales of, of, of daring or, you know, stories that are just not known enough, like um, the story of Wangare Matai in Kenya, um, who started the Black Belt movement, sorry, the Green Belt movement. And, um, and this got together, she was concerned about women, she was concerned about deforestation. So this got women planting trees and she was the first African Nobel Prize winner then there's Vandana Shiva, who's an amazing Indian woman who's been talking about the climate for so long. And, you know, in India, you've got so many male farmers who are um, who are uh, committing suicide um, because uh, partly because they're going bust, because large uh, international companies, transnational companies are patenting um, seeds. Uh, and um, and uh, genetically modifying them and patenting them, and then they're having to pay an awful lot. And Vandana Shiva set up an open source seed bank and a grandmother's university to pass on skills. And there are countless stories like this. Um, I give some of them in my book, and they are so exciting. They're happening all the time. So, you know, as against these um, lone pioneering figures in the global north, there are dozens of stories waiting to be uncovered in the global south and in the global north. I mean, in, in the US, there are areas known as cancer valleys or cancer alleys, sorry, where um, there's so many factories belching out carcinogenic smoke. Um, and they are almost all situated in BIPOC areas. Um, uh, of black indigenous people of color are mainly concentrating there. They've become known as sacrifice zones. And women in those areas, um, women of color have started organizing to um, control the emissions. So, I mean, you know, as against all the awful things, uh, stories we can talk about women as victims, there are women doing these incredible things. And I've got to stress here, that my book, and I, I really try and make that clear throughout, is not about sex, it's about gender. Now, in fact, the example I gave you about Pakistan is a story about, um, about sex, about women's reproductive roles. Uh, but most of the time we're talking about those um, social conventions and roles uh, around femininity and masculinity. And I try and stress the fact that there isn't a single masculinity, there are masculinities. So you, it has been argued that the climate crisis is a crisis of masculinity, but it's only of one kind of masculinity. You know, there are um, men who are absolutely supporting women, supporting all kinds of marginalized groups um, in fighting the climate crisis. So we we, we mustn't see this in a very reductive way as being kind of good women, bad men. Also, because there are some pretty bad women around, I have to say as well. Uh, that, what can I say? <laughs> yes, um, yes, some ineffective women for sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, there's so much in there, isn't there? The, the need for, the need for us to hear the voices of all those who are marginalized in some way, way, shape or form, because it's not just women, is it? But, you know, the, the marginalized, those we don't hear about, because then it prevents um, us um, uh, replicating and scaling out, uh, you know, copying uh, great work that's being done, um, you know, on the ground. 
and, and, and I'm, but I am still interested in, so I know there was a number, you, you had some great examples in the book of, of specific women that you, you know, you featured quite, you know, in quite a lot of detail around the work they're doing. And I was very struck when I was reading it. Um, uh, there was a, a, a lady called Stella Nyambura from Kenya um, and the work that she's doing. And then the next thing I'm reading about is about Annette Wolgren from Sweden, who, you know, who is clearly also doing some great work, but I just, there's a, it felt to me like it's a real counterpoint between where they both came from, if you like, how, how they got into this, how they got started. Um, I didn't, do you want to touch on, yeah. on, on each of those and yes. just share a little bit of that? Yes. So, so what happened was when I started to do interviews, I, um, I, I wanted, well, well, I started just doing one or two interviews. And then I thought, in fact, the first person I interviewed was Anissa Khan, who comes from Chennai in India originally, and then went to the US, got a, 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 a scholarship to study in the US. And now, lucky us, is living in the UK and is involved in Just Stop Oil, which you will have seen has absolutely come to the fore recently. Now, Anissa is a, is an example. So I interviewed her and I thought, I just cannot give, you know, a few lines of her because it's so interesting, her personal experience of the climate crisis in Chennai, both drought and floods and the city being cut off and then becoming a climate activist and going to events like the COP events, you know, the um, convention for parties, and seeing the nonsense that's being talked some of the time by people saying, oh, you know, fossil fuels can be a sustainable energy source and her thinking what? So I, I thought I've got to run some interviews at length to see, to show how their activism has kind of grown out of their experience. And I, it was actually under lockdown. So I was able to do the interviews under Zoom, but actually it was very hard, you know, I. I tried for three times as many women as I could get. And sometimes they had a very poor internet connection, um, as in the case of Adonika, um, a Nigerian activist who I do quote in the book, but unfortunately I couldn't record her because the connection was so bad. Um, so it took a lot for these women to actually give me their time. Uh, but I just felt that their stories make the activism come alive. And I worked very closely with them to, um, to, to condense those interviews to about a thousand words each. And I, I put one in between each chapter and they are, they're spread all over the world, but I wanted to give the majority of voices to women of color, but also to include a, a, an age range because I really, really, and I wrote an article for The Guardian about this a couple of years ago, I really dislike this emerging narrative that it's all old people who've messed up the planet and left it for kids to sort out. And, and uh, Greta Thunberg herself did flirt with that for a while. And it, 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 it sort of a develop, it, it was what we heard in the Brexit debate, you know, a bit, that age um, segmented narrative. Um, and it's such a nonsense because there are a lot of very poor old people in the global north as well. I mean, age mostly impoverishes people. Um, and there are people who've been talking about the climate crisis for a very long time. And there are old people in the, um, in the movement and there are young people. And as I said, we need all those voices. So I included um, an older woman um, uh, who is um, a Swiss woman who has been very active and trying to take her government to court and is now taking it further to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and this is part of a, another really exciting trend, which is climate litigation. Because don't forget, there have been changes in the last however many years. I mean, in 2008, um, there was the five year um, gender action plan. Um, then we have the Paris Agreement, which builds in gender, albeit in a very marginalized way again. And what these climate litigators have done, and a lot of them are women, a lot of them are young women, but they're also, as in um, the, uh, the, the example I give, older women. Um, they are saying, okay, 
okay, my country, you signed up to this, this, uh, this Paris Agreement, and we were all very chuffed and whatever. What are you doing? You're not sticking to it. And so they, in that gap between the, the promises and the reality, they are taking climate cases forward. And there was a group in, in the Netherlands, Urgenda, founded by um, Marianne Aminesma, a woman, that started this. And now there are climate litigation cases all around the world. And so this is another route, the legal route to go down. So very exciting. But as I say, all ages. And then you gave another example in my book. So, so um, well, the, Stella, um, I love Stella. She's very quiet, very modest, um, but she's got a doctorate and she is looking at how you can use the alternating facts of climate drought and climate flooding and work together. And there are some very other exciting examples I give in my book. But Annette works for um, a UN agency um, in Asia. She's working in Vietnam and Cambodia. So she's working again through different channels. And this again is my point that there isn't one single um, channel to work through. We can all, and you know, I, I, I just, sorry, I'm banging on too long, but I get very excited right, about right. this. But I did an event last November for a group that I love called the Women's Budget Group. And, um, and in that event, they were looking at local solutions. Because I think what happens is, it seems, as I said, like such an overwhelming global problem that we feel unless we have a global solution, there's no point. And um, it encourages what I call a kind of gigantism. And you see it in these, these ideas for geoengineering, I'm afraid to say mostly dreamed up by white men of let's have a giant umbrella in space to shield the earth from the sun, or let's have um, submarines that can refreeze the poles. These mad ideas that about hacking the climate that are being taken seriously, but can have really serious consequences. Now, by contrast, this event in November, you had this group talking about, it's a, a group on um, local leadership. And they said, think about local wealth um, generating organizations. Think about where you are. I mean, I'm sitting to you from a university, right? I also have a local authority. Um, you know, I'm a member of a trade, well, two trade unions, actually. All these different affiliations we have. So the example they gave was, let's say you work in a hospital. And these are real examples. You, you work in a hospital. The hospital, of course, is buying a lot of food. It needs a lot of food for its staff in canteens, for the patients. Mostly the food is inedible. I mean, if you've ever been in a hospital, an NHS hospital, I mean, you know, each time I've been in one, my husband's had to bring in food or I would have starved to death. Um, so, you know, they, they, where does the food come from? In a lot of cases, it comes from large multinational companies that are producing industrialized food and they are based in the Cayman Islands or the Virgin Islands, they're not paying any tax. So the example they gave was, look at the commissioning process. And in one hospital, they changed the commissioning process to local food producers who were producing organic food. And what happened was the food was far more tasty. It didn't have to travel so far. So the transportation costs were much lower. Local food producers were getting an income and everyone was getting better food. Now that is a solution, a local solution to a little bit of the climate crisis that works on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a good, I mean, that's just such a great example, isn't it? When just um, that, there's that great expression, or it's not a great expression, it's a very annoying expression of, you know, um, uh, think global, act local, or think local and act global. Or as I used to have a banner in my office many years ago, think global, act stupid, because it just seemed to be, <laughs> that seemed to be how it really played out far yes, too often. Yes. Um, you know, you cannot sum everything up to the macro macro level. Um, I think that point on lo locality, um, and you and I were chatting just before we started this about, you know, how 
different um how different how differently impactful politicians are when they are trying to be in some kind of big central government scenario versus being in a much more local role like a mayor um, and I just wonder, as we think about the kind of new green deals that are being much talked about, and then look at the, the, the sort of local authority or local political leadership, um, are you see, how are you seeing all of that play out? Do we have, is there a strength in these local organizations, um, you know, local, uh, local bodies like councils, et cetera, mayoral bodies? Absolutely. I mean, it, it was very really striking for me when I started to research the book and I was looking at mayors, how many of the mayors who are doing really, really green things, not greenwashing things, but really sustainable things were women. And I started to think about this. I thought, why are there so many women? And I thought, well, one reason is it, you know, I mean, the, the poll really is quite greasy up to the top of politics. You, I mean, you know, we've just, with the events of the last few days, I mean, you take someone like Liz Truss, you can see in all the accounts of her, how long she has been working towards this aim, which has come to such an ignominious end. Um, mayordom is, you can, you can become a mayor probably a little quicker. You don't have to go through the same, you know, fortuitous route. Um, and mayors are a little bit more nimble in that the structure is a little bit more direct. So that, I mean, if the example, uh, well, the, the one we were talking about, Andy Burnham in Manchester, who's working on local transport costs. But actually one of the ones I really like is um, Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris. Now she has become incredibly unpopular with um, drivers because she's been steadily shrinking the number of parking places in Paris. But she is trialing an idea that's really gaining traction among mayors around the world, the so-called 15 minute or 20 minute city, which rests on the idea that um, all the essentials for kind of work, um, school or education, um, health care, leisure care, shops should be within 15 minute walk or bike ride. And if you think of the implications of that, they are enormous. I mean, first of all, reducing our dependence on motorised transport. I mean, of course, with lockdown, we got a kind of preview of that mm. because we couldn't go anywhere. And of course, we all discovered Zoom, etc. But also, if you think about women's lives, um, uh, women's, because women at the moment have most of the caring roles, either childcare and elder care, this um, has an enormous impact on women's employment outside the home. Now, I do not fetishize employment outside the home, nor do I fetishize an idealized care because care is very demanding, but it also is a very important, very, very central part of life, as we discovered in the, in the pandemic. So most people I know who have the opportunity would like to do, be able to do both, would like to be able to do the care, um, but not to suffer the penalties. Mm. Now, when you shrink the orbit of daily life, when you shrink how far you have to travel for things, you immediately change the kind of juggling role that women in particular do, but men who undertake childcare or elder tech care um, do as well. So, you know, these kinds of ideas coming at it from a slightly different viewpoint are really interesting, I think. And they, you know, they are a re-envisaging of how our cities work of how our daily lives work. And we need to really be open to these kind of radical, exciting new ideas. Yeah, I, I, I well, I, I, I think the thing is that you're touching on there is something I've been very obsessed with for many years, as Paul knows, to his cost, um, is this concept of enlightened self-interest. And, you know, if you can find that there, you know, multiple values, if you like, multiple benefits of doing a particular thing, uh, taking a particular approach, that, um, a higher level of localization of services and life in, in a city environment 
absolutely has so many societal benefits that are that, that before you even touch the environmental you know um climate change related absolutely. ones and, and then the more boxes it ticks the the stickier it is isn't it the the and the easier it is to sell and the easier to get people to engage um so the people the people who are joining us uh, here today and um you know are from businesses they're from um you know marketing agencies they're from uh you know large organizations um what do you as you think about what we talked about already and so much more in the book and everything what are the kind of things that we should be we all should be thinking about as we go about our day jobs um how do we help to amplify this message that that there is more to this than just the pure and simple climate change and yes it would be amazing if we could just dump the fossil fuels for good and all and everything but you know, while that while that continues to not happen, there's a lot else we need to do. Give us a few pointers. Okay. okay. So, I mean, I, I want to start by saying what I think you shouldn't do. And it's very easier for me to say <laughs> sitting here as I'm employed by a university, or at least part of the time. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I recognize that your room for maneuver may be limited. It's important to be realistic about that. By the same token, I would urge you to recognize that about the people you are addressing in your marketing. So not to collude with greenwashing or what's been called the feminization of responsibility. So, you know, it's all women. So, I mean, I, I've talked before in other settings about my attempt to, I mean, I, I was made professor a few years ago. I haven't yet given my inaugural lecture because of lockdown. I will be giving it in February. I would like quite like to buy myself a new dress because I wear clothes for a very, very long time. Um, <laughs> I just I just gave one of my daughters something, a cardigan, which I've been wearing until recently that I bought in 1979. So you can see I do. I cannot find something that isn't made out of polyester that I like and that when I think of the number of hours I've spent looking for a non-polyester stylish dress hours that I will never get back in my life I don't think it's a good use of my time so I would urge you to try and find creative ways of resisting um, putting everything on individual you know women as individual consumers and this way of this idea of buying our way into a sustainable planet. Um, I think there are a lot of exciting stories out there. It may need a bit of digging to get to find them. And there are organizations who will help you, who will help you connect with examples. Uh, because I think what you said before, Caroline, is absolutely right. I mean, it's when you you know, it's all very well thinking about the idea in abstract, but when you think of an actual concrete embodied person going through this, either um, experiencing the terrible effects of the climate crisis, or conversely, finding ways of doing things that will challenge it, it just brings it all to life. And that is your collective expertise in, in, in telling stories like that. And I think don't... Um, don't underestimate the power of storytelling, of you know bringing individuals like that to um, to people's attention. I think you're also in a very special position because you are a link between organisations and businesses and the public, and you're in a very good position to in you know your I think your communication, if I've understood your roles properly is you communicate in two ways, up the chain of command in the organizations that you are working for or hired by, and then outwards towards the public. So you are in a position, may only be in a very small way, but it's still a valuable way, to actually remind the organizations you're hired by that if they treat the public and customers and the, their audiences with respect um, as adults and are frank, it really will repay. It really will repay. So 
you know, let's say you are working for an organization that's producing clothing and, you know, would like the people who are producing the clothing, mainly poor women of color, probably in Bangladesh, um, to be properly paid. But you're not really sure because we know that there are all these inspect inspections and it's, you know, it's like a, a Potemkin's village. Everything looks very neat. And we know that, you know, fess up, fess up to the public, say, we've come so far, but we've got some way to go. And we'll keep monitoring, we'll keep checking in. And if you hear stories, tell us, you know, the, the different, I think we've all become so tired to the kind of spin, you know, I think it was kind of novel when Tony Blair stood up after Princess Diana died and talked about the Queen of Hearts and, you know, with that break in his voice. And we've become so fed up with hearing politicians and spin and influencers and social media. I think most of us have had it to that. And when you hear a really authentic voice, when you hear an organization saying, do you know, we really got that wrong. Or, do you know, we've done something we're not sure about. You know, I, I mean, there's that whole chassis thing that I cannot stand that you find on, you know, on oat milk or, you know, an innocent smoothie, or forgive me if there are a lot of representatives of innocent here, which is all kind of matey. And it's like, you're, we're your mate. No, you're not my mate. I just want to buy something to drink. Don't over you know, don't patronize me that I'm going to think we're best mates. It's like when someone, you get cold called by someone and they say, oh, hello, so how are you today? And I think, what's it to you? Why am I going to tell you how I am? Um, don't get over matey and fess up. You know, I nobody expects overnight transitions. I mean, we are going to be involved in a massive transition. We're, if this planet's going to survive, or if the human beings on the planet are going to survive, it's not going to happen overnight, but it does need to start now. Tell people, yeah. don't, you know, and so they say that the new climate denial is climate delay. And they say, <laughs> oh yes, by 2050, we were, I'm not interested in 2050. I am almost certainly going to be dead by 2050, unless I have an extremely long life. I mean, both of my parents had long lives, but, you know, I will probably be a right croc. Um, I, you know, I'm interested in now. I'm interested in the steps you're taking now. And I don't expect magic. And I think we will feel like that. So we need to give the public much more credit than they've been given. Fess up and say, you know, our record has not been great. We're starting on this process and encourage people in you know I mean there's all this idea that people want you know you need to get people invested in brands well what better way is than to say if you've got suggestions and we're not expecting you to do our job for us we know that we're paid to do this we get the profits you're not but you know we would welcome your suggestions mm -hmm. to create an alliance between customers and users and producers um, I think, um, I think, uh, and it's really interesting. We had an exchange. I, I forget now, maybe a year ago now, here about um, human trafficking, and we had a fantastic speaker from um, a, a big hospitality group, so pubs and hotels and stuff, who are really doing exactly what you're saying. It's on a, on a different topic, but really doing the same. They're, they're they're being very public about when they find. Uh, risks or actual instances of human trafficking in their supply chains, they, they call it out. They're not hiding. They're saying this is really difficult. We're doing what we can. And I, I so I think that's a really, I mean, it's, it's hard to do. and It's very hard to get um, large, big brands to go there. Um, but there are some already doing it in different spaces. And so that, I think that's a really interesting. I mean, uh, I think it's a difference, Caroline, that one of the things is occasionally, sometimes we all, and we all know results of this, uh, brands do it in a slightly cynical way, and it is in this kind of slightly cheesy, you know, we're we're the good guys, you know. And in yeah. fact, it's not actually doing that. It's saying, 
we know that some of the time we're not the good guys and we this is where we've come from and this is where we're trying to get to and at the moment we're just at the beginning of the journey and this is true for all of us i mean yes. you know there's no one who's climate pure you can't live in this culture no, no, no. but we have to we have to get away from this notion that we have to pretend to be perfect don't we yeah. um i'm gonna go we've got some questions coming in um uh uh online here so i'm going to go right. go take them in the order they come in so um what advice would you give liz truss's replacement as prime minister heaven help us whoever that may turn out to be um on on this topic what would you have them do um oh my god what a fantastic and almost impossible to answer question well i mean the very first thing i would do is ban fracking i mean you know <laughs> that was the fiasco yesterday and of course that would absolutely appeal to conservative voters because they do not want it other you know okay i i would make one exception we should be able to frack in um jacob reese mogg's garden he said he's happy <laughs> for that so that's the one except otherwise no fracking um i think um we probably need to set up or he or she needs to set up citizens assemblies um around climate change so we absolutely build in democratic vote. We need transition plans. It's not going to happen overnight. Every local area needs a transition plan. Every business, every responsible business needs its own transition plan. Both about how, you know, I'm in a university and we're beginning to do that. I, so I was at a meeting yesterday about that. You know, where does the electricity from this building come from? Um, where are our pension funds invested? Um, can we withdraw pension funds um, from financial institutions that are backing fossil fuel companies and high emitters? You know, we have incredible power. Anyone who's got a pension, who pays into a pension. Um, so I think I would start with um, local citizens assemblies working on local levels and national levels. Um, I, I mean, I suppose the single thing I would do most is, uh, do you remember when, um, I think it was the Labour Party introduced part of the Equality Act that people had to think of the um, equality implications of, of every piece of legislation. What we need to do is think of the climate and equality. So climate and climate justice implications of every single piece of legislation. And that should be made instantly into law. And honestly, the impact of that would be massive, absolutely massive. Um, so that, those are my, my initial That's thoughts. A, I love those. They are fabulous start points. And I think that point around requiring organizations from government onward and um, you know if i can just add one thing yeah. caroline if you think government and local government they have you know if their procurement rules i mean there's one local mayor um is it in lyon in france i can't remember Grenoble, who they're doing that um, their procurement rules anyone they buy goods and services off has got to meet a green sustainability threshold. I mean, the moment you do that, you are changing things practically overnight. You are ruling out certain companies and ruling in other companies. I mean, it's an incredibly effective power. Uh, it, 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 I mean, I, I really agree with you. And you know, I mean, it's been happening. Um, it's been happening for quite some years in, in, in the businesses who have really been on the front foot on this, that literally, the carbon, the carbon impact of delivering goods or service has been part of the um, the procurement process. And you, uh, you know, if you're the supplier of the goods or service, you have to be able to evidence uh, that. And 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 I know, I know from my days in IBM that that we won bids against other big competitors because we were able to deliver with a lower carbon footprint. And mm -hmm. It's a back then. I'm going back maybe 10, 12 years in time now. But back then, it was quite rare. But mm -hmm. you're exactly right. It's, a, it's such a power. It's a, such a powerful thing that so many organisations have at their fingertips. Um, 
Uh, okay, the next one I've got here. This is the climate emergency effect affects us all, even though it affects some of us more than others, um, obviously, um, and needs us all to change. The trouble is no one is in charge of everyone. That is very true. Uh, where do you see the biggest opportunities for leadership and do you believe these will be taken? Oh, gosh, that's a really difficult one to answer. Um, where is the biggest possibility for leadership? Well, obviously, I mean, in a way, in a way, you could argue government, but I would say probably business, actually, because business is more important than, than government. I mean, I would say the language needs to change, but because, you know, we've all learned to speak fluent green and it isn't necessarily matched, matched with actions, uh, probably that isn't the case. I think, honestly, if a few major business leaders really um, renounced um, fossil fuels or set themselves on a path to decarbonize their production or mm. their business, mm. um, I think it could become quite a competitive thing, you know, who's who's going further. And... Um, so I do think the potential uh, in business is enormous, um, that if you have some bold leaders, and I mean, for example, even though I was rather disappointed to read today's going to stand as a Tory candidate, but Richard Walker of Iceland, he's mm -hmm. an interesting, he's an interesting man. Uh, I mean, he's really, I think, begins to get the climate crisis. You know, he's he's really thinking about the really nitty gritty about how you display um, fruit, for example, and how, what happens if you don't wrap it in plastic, but do sales go down? Because obviously a business exists to make a profit. I mean, personally, I believe that we have pri privatized, you know, essential goods and services, which should be in the public, publicly owned. And um, the majority of, of, of um, the public, the British public, actually agree with me. And actually, the majority of Conservative voters, interestingly, as well. But, you know, businesses, if you're making clothes, unless you're a, a, a small cooperative, you're going to make, you, you're, you're in business to make a profit. So you need to make a profit. Otherwise, you will close down and the people who depend on you for a livelihood won't be able to. So you're constantly balancing. But if you have, if you declare yourself publicly committed to um, equality, equality of opportunity in your business, um, I, I'm particularly interested in disability. I've been writing about disability for more than three decades. And uh, I think this is such an interesting question. I've written a lot about age as well. So I'm interested in all these aspects of equality. If you have big business leaders who make a commitment to decarbonize their business, to um, to transition away from fossil fuels and at the same time to make their businesses run more equitably. First of all, the loyalty that you will feel from your workforce. I mean, you know, there's high on it, there's uh, um, low unemployment at the moment. So, you know, in theory, people can pick and choose, not of well paid jobs, but the jobs that are give proper job satisfaction where people feel respected um, and they feel that they are working towards a good common collective aim, those are going to be desirable jobs. You will build a very loyal workforce. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that business leadership, uh, it really chimes with me because, um, well, governments have utterly failed us on this issue. Um, they failed us on equality too, but but you know on climate change very specifically they've utterly failed us, and some businesses have stepped up, and so many more could and should, and that they they have a long term sustainability well, requirement that, of their own. That is it because and governments really think in 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 five year cycles. Yep. They want to get re-elected and they will do what they can. So you know they'll make all kinds of promises or whatever. Business leaders have to think more long term to yeah. build a, a really sustainable pres, uh, business. Yeah. Very much, very much so. Um, uh, the next one, uh, Anne, can enough change be unlocked without reducing prosperity? This is a really interesting, a really interesting point. 
Um, and if not, how can we deal with the inevitable costs of the problems likely to be caused by rising conflict and impacts? I just want to throw in here, I don't know if you're all familiar with Gus John. He's a, he's a very esteemed educationalist, extraordinary gentleman, and um, talks, you know, and talks unbelievably powerfully about racism. And he makes the very clear point to everybody um, that if we are talking about uh, a truly inclusive uh, racial uh, ethnicity environment, those who have the most are going to have to give something up to those who don't have anything. And it is a really is a very powerful challenge because you, you sit there thinking, I, I'm a liberal with a small L. I care passionately about um, about anti-racism. And yet, um, what am I willing to give up as a very privileged white person? And what am I willing to give up? Um, blah, blah, blah. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a really powerful challenge that sort of makes you step back and think it's great to have these opinions, Caroline, but you know, can you can you actually live up to what you think? Anyway, so it's, it's a, a, it's a change lot without reducing prosperity. Okay. And if not, it, what do we do about it? It's a wonderful question because it it throws up so many important issues here. And the first one is what do we mean by prosperity? And can we have real prosperity in one part of the country and not in the other? So those of us who are prosperous, who are in the top, say, 10, 15, certainly 20% of the population, um, so there is, it, it can make a lot of um, anxiety to think, oh, well, what's gonna happen? But what is prosperity? if we can't get an NHS appointment, if you've got um, suspected cancer and you're having to wait a long time for treatment or even for, for diagnosis, but for treatment uh, and you have to go private, what is the prosperity? You might be using a huge chunk of your earnings um, uh, to, to you'd be spending on that. Or your children go to school do you feel you've got to pay for private schooling because the quality of the schooling is so bad? Um, uh, all those public facilities, we all use them. Um, and if you feel the need to buy yourself out of them, you're not prosperous because you won't, be end, you won't up, end up with very much. The, the, the writer George Monbiot said, what we need is public affluence and private austerity and not the other way around and the moment we've got it the other way around we've got a lot we've got quite a lot of very rich people quite a lot of comfortably off people um and a lot a lot in this sixth richest country in the world the extent of poverty is just unbelievable and that is what causes instability because eventually you will get riots and things like that. You will get more crime because people need to feed their children and they will, you know, they'll steal nappies from supermarkets if they can't afford to buy them. They'll break into people's houses to get some jewelry to sell it. Um, so, um, so we have to think about it in a much broader sense. And the work of Kate Rayworth, I would recommend you here, the author of Donut Economics, some of you will know. And she says, look, think of a donut and think of the inner ring is what everybody needs to live. Um, so you think of um, shelter, good shelter, to have a home to live in and not to live under fear of eviction or or um, leaks coming through the roof and to have enough space. Um, think of education, well-staffed schools where the children are, are stimulated. Think of food that children aren't going to school hungry. Think of um, a, a job that gives you some satisfaction and gives you the chance to grow. These, these are fundamental basic human needs that we should all have. And that is what is a prosperous society. And then the outer ring um, of the donut is what the planet can sustain. And in between those are going to be where we live. And the planet can sustain the population we have now. It's an absolute myth, this overpopulation thing. It's a problem of distribution. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily 
uh, that you individually are going to give up things. Yes, if you consume a lot, you're going to have to. But the structures in which you live are going to make it easier for you to live a greener life because it will be easier to buy nourishing locally produced food. It should be that is cheap. So you won't need so much money, you know, and, and OK, people say this is idealistic. It is. It, this is the realism that the, the, the giant umbrella protecting us from the sun is the fantasy that the, there is no reason why people should not have access to locally produced cheap food in a different um, in a different economic model. So all these things are possible. And what lockdown showed us is how quickly things can change. And, you know, if you are as old as me, you can remember feeling hopeless about apartheid, that it would never change. The Berlin Wall would never come down. Um, Northern Ireland, OK, you know, it's not resolved in a final, final way. But all these things seemed, you know, unimaginable to change. So we have to be prepared to think in a very wide way. But these are some of the changes. So I, I would say we will need to rethink what prosperity is. Um, and, it, and we need to stop thinking in quite such an individualistic way that if we live in a culture that has really good public services, um, then we will begin to make a change in our lives where we put less value on possessions. And honestly, I really include myself here as culprit because I know how invested I get in, in possessions. And, you know, it's nice having things that are um, a reflection of oneself um, that are beautiful. I mean, William Morris said, have nothing around you that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. And I feel that way. I like having you know, beautiful paintings and nice sculptures and things like that. But I also will value living in a neighborhood that is, has less crime, uh, where people feel more connected with each other, where there's less isolation. So that if I, that I, I don't want to be um, a lonely old woman, just as I didn't want to be a lonely young woman. And actually there's actually more loneliness in, young people 16 to 24 than almost any other group. It's a caricature of older people that they're all, all lonely, but there is a lot of loneliness among everyone. There's all this social media that makes us think we're all connected. So I don't think it's unrealistic to imagine that we live in a place where the, our public life is, is, is at least as nourishing as our private lives and supports us. And that will reduce our need for individual prosperity. Of course, you know, say, oh, you can't change human nature. Well, actually, human nature has changed a lot over the years because those of us of a certain age can remember a time when there wasn't as much consumption um, and, and where not such high value was put on, on ownership. And when you re-envisage and think about the commons, the things we own in common, and how to cherish those public spaces, you know, parks, squares, things that we came to value under lockdown, that if we, if we make those part of our riches, I think we will see a change, you know, not some magic wand, but I think we will understand prosperity in a different way. I think that's I think that's really that's a, a really powerful statement um, um, and, a, and, a, and, and a big challenge to the status quo. Um, uh, uh, another a question um, that's a little different, but um, it's a great point as well. Could Putin's invasion finally put us off fossil fuels? So obviously they're related. Well, what a, another great yeah. question. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, of course, what it did to the trust government was to issue all these drilling licenses for oil and gas, which, of course, is completely the wrong way, because what what the invasion of Ukraine did was it totally in the most dramatic fashion made us realize how fuel insecure we are and how utterly we are dependent on fuel coming from elsewhere and less in this country than other countries in Europe, say Germany, for example. <clears throat> 
And that if we had spent the last 10 years building up our reserves of renewable energy, and, you know, all the different ones, you know, um, solar, wave, and wind, um, how much less vulnerable we would have, we would be to a tyrant like that. I mean, he is hoping that he is going to squeeze the, um, the countries in the West until they won't, the population won't take it anymore. And you can see the terrible rise in prices. So potentially, if it's handled in the right way, it could do that. But there's going to be a lot of pain on the way, which is why, obviously, um, there's a need to subsidise people's bills and, and to do it um, not out of taxation, but to do it in a different way. Um, but yes, I mean, I think that, you know, that is a very good point. I mean, and it, it is a really interesting one, isn't it? Uh, it it is it's such an opportunity you know things happen dynamically in the world and you have to grab the opportunity and almost ride the coattails of the chaos to uh to to try and um shift the public mindset um that of course i'm going to cook on gas you know because gas is better you know blah 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 i mean you know you know Cara, i'm going to tell you a really shameful thing here honestly um I'm not proud of this, but you know, I moved into my new house and you know, we downsized and it's a very old kitchen, bits falling apart, we've got to have a new kitchen. And so, yes, and we went to somebody who'd done, done our kitchen before. And honestly, I didn't really think about the hob. And then I went to our neighbors because it's a little terrace and four fairly modern houses, they're all identical. And they said, oh, we've got an induction hob. And I started to make a connection, which, I mean, I'd just written a book on the climate crisis, for God's sake. I started to make a connection. Oh, an induction hob is electricity. I'm putting up solar panels. I will be able to power that. And then I thought, oh, but I'm not really used to it. Oh, it doesn't, but, and I just thought, oh, it's five minutes, I'm used to it. So. It's a, it's a real gestalt switch that's needed and to join up these disparate things. And we're all going to do it at our own pace in our own way. But yes, I think so I love it. It's a perfect example because it's, it's how we all it's how we all are. We're, there are things that we're used to doing in a particular way. And of course, we've always done it this way. So, you know, and, unless we're sort of jolted into thinking differently uh, about each of those things, and that's our different modes as human beings, isn't it? You know, as a as, as you know in our personal lives I'm a keen cook so um and by the way I love induction hobs yes I do too now. <laughs> it's exactly. utterly marvelous um not least because we're easier to clean um mm. but but yeah it's just it's interesting we have to be jolted out of out of these 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 modes um uh and we're sort of coming to the end of our time I just want to I want to kind of bring us back to where we started really which was how women can save the planet and I know that's a slightly tongue-in-cheek um uh slightly challenging title because not really your point at all is it um but I think it's you know how how do we how do we tackle these the, the this balance of the inequality that exists and the fact that those who are the least equal those who have the least are being impacted the most obviously that's big time in the in the global south but wherever you look you know if you if you take um, i don't know take india it is it is the indigenous populations there it's, it's like about 10 percent of the population isn't it who are who who are the ones who are most likely to suffer from the issues that are that are that are you know emerging um so well look let sorry do you want yeah to yeah no i'm just going to say so we've you know we've talked a little bit about you know uh rethinking about prosperity as a societal rather than an individual thing. We've talked about um, business leadership versus government leadership, which doesn't really exist these days. We've talked about the authenticity and authenticity through storytelling to really engage the public in this. But if we want to bring it back to, not just to women, but to um, how, we, how we really take uh, hold of this issue of inequality and climate justice where 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 should we go in our final sort right. of few minutes of talking right well i mean actually just to return to women for a second mm. i mean one of the a couple of the well it's more it's about half a dozen pieces of really robust interesting research uh show that when women are involved in um 
it, uh, in politics and have uh, countries where women have high, higher political status or uh, where women are um, more active um, have more um, have much more sustainable environmental legislation. So, and, and this is not through, because, you know, I don't believe in earth mothers or women have a caring gene or anything like that. Um, but this is largely because women have to pick up the pieces when things go AWOL. And, you know, if your house is, is you know, in, uninhabitable, you're going to have to set up an alternative home. So that really argues for women getting involved. Now, you know, we've just seen, you know, a, a, a piece of, of uh, um, a debate and a vote on fracking led by Liz Truss. So I'm not going to go into that all women a good thing. And um, also the idea that you just bring in a load of women and everything changes because that's the sort of Sheryl Sandberg lean in view all about empowerment of women that I really don't buy into. So the, the important thing is that we need to keep linking the issue of inequality and the climate crisis and to see how the balance of power between the global north and the global south has created this. And I give lots of examples in my book about how we have changed countries that um, had sustain, you know, sustainable subsistence uh, food production and we have made them monocultures, monocrop, monoplantations producing for the global north where they are utterly unresistant to the climate crisis. Uh, uh, but now, um, in certain places, they are trying to um, diversify. And I've got a new doctoral student starting in January who's going to be looking at Zimbabwe and how tackling the climate crisis is changing um, the social roles of women. So I think the first thing is we have to keep these things together. Climate crisis didn't arise out of nowhere. It arose out of a specific social, political, and economic system that produced it in actually a relatively short period of time. I mean, climate, you know, climate change sounds all leisurely and whatever. This is something that has happened. I mean, in the book, I say that how much of this has happened since my first child was born in 1989 it is t you know when i think of it in those terms it's shocking mm. so it's happened in a, it's happened in response it, it's the product of a political particular social political economic system that needs changing we cannot ch you know go back to audrey lord the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. we have to think big but we also have to think low. And we all have to think about our, the, 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 the groups that we are part of, where we can start. We don't have to all take on the world. You know, we all have liberty. If you've got small children, if you're looking after old people, if you've got an incredibly demanding job, you cannot, you don't have huge amounts of time available all the more reason to husband that time, sorry about the word, um, to channel your time really very effectively. What can I do? I can join a local group. I may not be able to attend all the meetings. I can join a local campaign. I can, what can I do in my place of work to try and make it more equitable and deal with the climate crisis at the same time? Am I part of a supply chain that I can influence? You know, we can't change the world individually. We can be part of a collective change and there is change in the air because the, number, the, the extent of eco-anxiety tells you is a good thing. It's an awful thing for young people to be so anxious that they can't rely on a stable future. But it's a good thing because it tells us how many people are thinking about this, and working about, worrying about this. And together we can be part of the change. We're either part of the, of the status quo or we're part of the change. So we have to work out in our daily lives, what bit can I do? What bit, not just changing what I buy, or eating less meat, all of which are important things to do, or not eating meat at all, whatever. But how can I join with other people in putting pressure on those who have power? 
And we'll all come up with different solutions and at different stages in our life, we'll be able to do different things. And we should not beat ourselves up too much about, you know, what we can't do because, you know, women in particular are very good at, at, at producing guilt about what, what we can't do. But we can all do something and we all have to do something now because, um, you know, it is the it is the 11th hour. And as I said in my book, you know, it is time. But I, I, I nevertheless am, am hopeful. I um I think uh, that's a perfect place to to stop Anne because you have been talking this, this afternoon to a coalition of hopers. Um, uh, I think that really uh, fundamentally <laughs> defines who we are at Marketing Kind. Um, I, I always remember being told that hope is not a strategy, but it's an awfully good place to start with uh, with with the strategies that we do employ. Um, it's been a fascinating and really important conversation for all of us. Um, and really, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing uh, sharing so much insight, but also, uh, you know, really provoking us to think differently, um, which is uh, which is super important for all of us. I I think Paul and Anna, we we need to come back to this um, this topic because I think for all of us, engaging the public is what so many of us do in different ways. Um, uh, and I think that there's some expertise in, in storytelling, much expertise in storytelling in this group, um, a lot of very strong business leadership. Um, but I think this challenge to keep linking inequality and, and climate, the climate crisis, climate justice, um, is a really, really important thing for us to do. Um, I'm gonna, I would like to highly recommend to all of you um, Anne's book, um, because I, uh, how, how Women Can Save the Planet, because um, it's, A, it's, it'll give you more depth on so much of what Anne has talked to us about this afternoon, but also there's a fantastic list of resources towards the back of it, groups that you can engage with and other, and other books that you can read. So um, that's a, it's a superb, a superb read. Thank um, you so much for inviting me because this is the first time I've really spoken in this uh, kind of environment and the questions really provocative, interesting questions. And I've so enjoyed talking to you, Caroline, oh. really. Fantastic. Um, well, we, we, we feel very privileged, privileged to be able to dig in. Look, uh, to everybody that's joined us online today, um, thank you for joining us. And for all those who, who watch the replay, thank you for taking the time to do that. If you're new to Marketing Kind and you'd like to join us to get to work with your heroes, support your peers in the industry uh, and build on your own achievements, um, then have a look at the membership information on our website. That's at marketingkind.org. Um, and I should remind you that we have uh, our next exchange is coming up on November the 8th um, and it follows on from the launch of Paul's, uh, Paul's um, book, The Purpose Upgrade. Um, the subject is how can we upgrade the purpose of enterprise? And there's they're both going to be an in-person session in central London, <laughs> uh, but also we'll be online uh, through the wonders of Zoom. Uh, so November 8th at five o'clock. So and thank you very much. And I want to leave you the final thought. Back in 2009 at COP15 in Copenhagen was a really fabulous group of young people. And and their challenge to everybody there was, how old will you be in 2050? And it made me think, because I sat there and I worked out and, I, you know, I'll fess up. I'll be 85 in 2050. I possibly won't be. I'll possibly been six feet under for some years. And it's not to say that this is a young people's thing. And it's nothing about, you know, whether you've got children, grandchildren in my case, da, da, da. But it is about we need to act now. And you made this point. We can't wait for 2030 or 2050. We need to be doing stuff right now, this week, today, tomorrow. And, and I just think it's a very powerful, still a very powerful call to action that each of us who think about this um, need to think that we're not, many of us on this call right now are not going to be in a position to take action in 2050. Um, so, so, so we need to take our responsibility and do what we can and make our contribution here uh, now in the current time uh, and, not, and not wait. Um, on that note, thank you very much, Anne. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Paul and Anna, as always, for um, bringing us all together and look forward to catching up with everybody very soon. Thanks and good night. Thank you.